Um, so following Alan's presentation, I'm tempted to spend my slot telling you personal stories about being waylaid by uh, following GPS devices. But instead, I'm going to talk to you about another much lower level class of algorithms uh, that also suffer in rural areas. And I'm going to describe how we use these algorithms to understand the interplay of different biases in social media-based algorithms. Now, reading the title would probably take up the rest of my time, so let's just get into it. When we started this research project, we knew a few things. Uh, first is that while social media offers a fascinating lens into society, it can also cause problems when used for research. For instance, social media has population biases, which is to say it's not always representative of the broader population. And this can skew conclusions in research done using social media, because we can easily miss phenomena and populations that are not appropriately represented on these platforms. But the community is doing a good job of delineating this and restructuring research to account for it, allowing us to reach more representative conclusions. What we didn't know was this, though. How do these population biases affect the many algorithms that are built on top of social media data? Specifically, does population bias in social media lead to biases in the output of social media-based algorithms as well? And if so, does correcting for population bias, as has been suggested as a best practice for research, de-bias the output of these algorithms? To address these questions, we looked at a specific use case of population bias in social media-based algorithms. The choices we made were as follows. We focused on one particularly prevalent type of population bias, urban-rural bias. On almost any social media platform, people from urban areas, as opposed to rural areas, are overrepresented in number and generally more active as well. What this means is that when we randomly sample social media data, or our, regardless of whether we're gathering posts or users, the sample tends to have more urban data and less rural data than one would expect. We studied how urban-rural bias affects a particular class of social media-based algorithms, known as geolocation inference algorithms. And we did so on Twitter, as the predominant platform for which these algorithms are built. With that in mind, I'm going to uh, go through each of these more in depth. Uh, so let's just start with an example. This is a tweet that my advisor sent out recently. And if you read this, you might see that he's doing research on the sharing economy and geography and think, wow, this guy must have some really, really awesome graduate students. I sure would love to be a part of that lab. I wonder where they're at, though. And hopefully, none of you, as humans, would have any problem figuring that out. Uh, but figuring out that we're at Northwestern, which is in Evanston, Illinois, is a bit more challenging for algorithms. Specifically, geolocation algorithms have been designed for this task. So they take tweets whose locations aren't known, like Brent's tweet because he's privacy conscious, and they make connections between them and other tweets or Twitter users they've seen whose location is known. And then they spit out the tweets having predicted where they're from. And I'm interested in this process because, as I suggested before, it's imperfect. In reality, we have something more like this, where only some of these input tweets are actually correctly located. And you know, that would be fine. Uh, it's true of almost any algorithm that it's not perfect, but the concern is, when we think about how this algorithm is trained to predict the location of a tweet, you have all these tweets that are fed into it. And while Twitter looked like the United States, you might expect something like this, with a bit more urban tweets than rural tweets. Actually, you get a much more skewed distribution, with even more urban tweets than rural tweets. So let's say, for example, that normally the algorithm is 50% correct for everyone, urban or rural. You might instead see that the algorithm performs better for urban tweets than it does for rural tweets. And this would be output bias. And that led to the first research question that we addressed in this study. Is there output bias in the direction of population bias? In other words, do geolocation inference algorithms perform better for urban tweets than they do for rural tweets? And if that's true, the next obvious question is how you might fix it. So getting back to our training data, what has been suggested is that if you corrected for the population bias, so instead of it being representative of Twitter, the data was representative of the US population again. Maybe that would even out the algorithm's performance. And that led to our second research question. If you remove the population bias, does this actually correct the output bias? But say that doesn't even work. The algorithm still does not perform well for rural tweets. What if we train the algorithm purely on rural tweets? That is, a geolocation algorithm built specifically for rural tweets. That becomes our third and final research question in this study. To what degree can we fix output bias through the rebalancing and training data alone? And at this point, I want to take a step back here and explain why we should care about the performance specifically of geolocation algorithms in urban and rural areas beyond just as a means of studying the relationship between population bias and output bias. 
So geotag tweets and to a varying degree geolocation inference algorithms to increase the number of geotag tweets have been used in a wide variety of applications. It's not just identifying cool graduate school labs. On the research side, this includes public health, so tracking and the prediction of disease or health factors. Uh, computational social science, we see studies on things like the happiness or the mobility of different groups of people. But also political polling, so asking questions like what do the uh, residents of Colorado think about a particular piece of policy? And even, unfortunately, surveillance as well, so of protesters and of dissidents. Which is to say that the effectiveness of geolocation algorithms can have far-reaching impacts, both potentially beneficial or invasive. And with that in mind, let's step through our specific methods. For data, we use geotag tweets in, from the contiguous United States. There are actually two different types of geolocation algorithms that we implemented for this study. Uh, the first is text-based geolocation. So thinking about our training data again, in this approach, you're teaching the algorithm to associate the words and tweets with the location from where they came. So looking back at Brent's tweet, if the location was known to be in Evanston, the model would begin to associate each of the words in the tweet with Evanston as well as the text of all the metadata of the tweet, too. So Brent's description of himself, the language he's using, his time zone, and self-reported location. Though quite often the self-reported location is not, either not provided or uh, not useful for geolocation. So in our study, we built on a well-regarded implementation of text-based geolocation. It's open source and it was developed by Reed Predhorsky and colleagues. So I just want to take a second to say a big, big thank you to them. Uh, open source is very important to us for being able to control the different aspects of the algorithm that we needed for this study. The other main approach is network-based. So th in this approach, you ignore the content of the tweet and you instead just ask, where Brent's friends are located. So in this example, Brent has five friends with known locations, and then the algorithm locates him as the median of these locations, with some constraints, of course. In our study, we built on implementation of this that was developed by David Jurgens and was also open source. So again, a very big thank you for that, to them for that. So with our algorithms chosen, we then need to identify a form of population bias in our data set so we can control for it in each research question. As I mentioned before, we chose to study urban-rural biases. And it's worth mentioning that urban versus rural isn't just a question of population density. It's also associated with a strong cultural divide as well, which in part motivated our choice. So for measuring urban-rural bias, we take each tweet and we identify where, which county it came from. And then we label it as urban or rural accordingly. We can then compare the proportions in our data set to how many tweets should actually come from each type of area. And if Twitter was representative of the United States population, 55% of our tweets should be urban and an additional 15% should be rural, with the rest being a suburban class. And what we find is that in our data sets, as expected, uh, there's a skew towards urban tweets. So an aside here, because of the particular demands of our two algorithms and our study, uh, we ended up using two different Twitter data sets here, one for each algorithm. Uh, the text-based algorithm is actually predicting the location of a tweet, while the network-based algorithm is predicting the location of a user. Um, but because of this, I'm going to caution against directly comparing the results for each algorithm. What's going to be important is to pay attention to how each algorithm responds to the manipulations in each research question. So then that just leaves us with how we measure the output bias of these algorithms. So for our test data, we have a given tweet whose location is known, Denver, for instance. And we also feed it into a model, though we don't tell the model where the tweet's location is, of course. And the model then makes a prediction about where it thinks the tweet is from, either using the content of the tweet from the network, if it's the text-based algorithm, or the location of the friends of the Twitter user themselves, if it's the network-based algorithm. And we track whether the prediction is within 100 kilometers of the correct location, which in this example would not be. And though distance might not be the best metric of accuracy, it is commonly used in evaluating geolocation inference models. Uh, and we attempt to stay as true as possible to standard implementation and usage. So we compare the percentage of correct predictions for urban tweets and rural tweets to determine if there is an output bias. OK, we're now ready to step through our results for each research question. So for research question one, is there output bias in the same direction as population bias? In these results tables, you'll see the type of algorithm and associated research question on the left. In the middle is the percentage of training data for the models that was urban or rural. Uh, the absolute amount, amount of training data for each algorithm stays constant throughout. And as a reminder, for research question one, the percentages of training data that were urban or rural reflect the underlying Twitter data and thus contain urban rural bias, but it's how these algorithms are normally trained. 
And finally, the results will be on your right, with the precision of the algorithm detailed for both the urban and rural test data, with higher numbers reflecting better performance. And if there's output bias within each model, there will be a gap between urban precision and rural precision. And so for a text-based algorithm, we do see a gap, and a pretty large one at that. The precision in urban areas is more than twice as high as that in rural areas. And again, for a network-based algorithm, we also see a gap with better urban performance than rural performance. So it's pretty clear that for research question one, yes, we do see output bias in the same direction as population bias, and for both algorithms. And this isn't particularly surprising, but it is important to establish that there isn't just bias in the data, but also bias in the output of at least some of the algorithms that are built on top of this data. But at this point, we just have a correlation, which does not mean the actual, that the output bias is actually caused by the population bias. In order to test that in this research question, we remove the urban-rural bias in the training data and again measure the output bias in the algorithms. So building off our results from research question one, we train new models, where the only difference in these models compared to the previous models is the balance of urban-rural training data. So whereas the training data in research question one was representative of the Twitter population, the training data for these models was resampled to actually be representative of the U.S. population, which in practice means less urban training data and more rural training data. And we look to see if output bias disappears. Well, for the text-based algorithm, we see minimal change compared to the models from research question one that still contained urban-rural bias. So precision in urban areas goes down slightly, as you might expect, uh, because we reduced the proportion of urban training data. But precision in rural areas does not rise really at all. We added 50% more rural data and saw almost no change in performance. And this leaves us with the output bias relatively unchanged despite removing population bias. And I want to pause for a second here. This means that something else is going on that is not just population bias. There's additional bias present in the algorithm that is pre preventing equal performance. However, there is a bright spot. So with the network-based algorithm, we see the precision in rural areas uh, increase greatly and actually exceed the precision in, in urban areas. So did fixing population bias fix output bias? Well, mixed results. No for the text-based algorithm, but the original output bias in the network-based algorithm seemed to be fully due to population bias. Which brings us to our final research question. Can we address this one particularly stubborn instance of output bias the rural performance of the text-based algorithm by training our model on 100% rural data. This would be akin, again, to training a geolocation algorithm for rural tweets only. And with our third model, we want to know if we can boost the precision in rural areas to that of, ur to that of in urban areas, at a minimum where it was in the population balanced model. And we still don't get there, despite using training data only from rural areas. It's close, but still significantly lower precision. So summarizing, we did not achieve precision in rural areas that was akin to normal performance in urban areas through adjusting the balance of input data alone. Though for the network-based algorithm, we didn't even need to go this far. So what are the main takeaways from this study? So if you take away one thing from this paper, it should be that output bias is not just a function of population bias. That is, bias in input data isn't always the whole picture. So while population bias seemed to be the cause of output bias in the network-based algorithm, that was only partially the case for the text-based algorithm. And this is important because while as a community we've correctly raised concerns about correcting for population biases in social media data when doing research with it, we need to be aware that while resampling data sets can be beneficial, it will not always balance out bias in the outputs. And the ACM recently put out a statement to this effect, putting it simply that, Computational models can be distorted as a result of biases contained in their input data, so that would be population biases, and or their algorithms. And we're hoping that our work, and some more work to it, can begin to provide guidance as to just how important the balance of data is versus the choice and design of the algorithm, and lead to a better understanding of how to best manage these two potential sources of bias for new problems such as these. So geolocation algorithms aren't the only intelligent technologies that have been built over top social media data, nor is urban rural bias the only population bias in social media data. So if we want to talk about bias in algorithms in areas like these, we need to be careful to go beyond just describing bias in their training data and also pay attention to the design of algorithms and measure what bias looks like in their usage. The second takeaway is that we should take a closer look at structural bias. So structural bias is what we're calling the bias that is left over after removing population bias, though it does go by other names. But it's bias inherent in some aspect of the algorithm as opposed to the data available. And we have a number of hypotheses as to why the two algorithms responded so differently to the correction of urban-rural bias. 
So remember the text-based model is much less responsive to the correction of urban-rural bias. At a low level, it builds Gaussian mixture models for each word in the model. Because there are many overlapping words and tweets from urban and rural areas, though, urban tweets end up adding a fair bit of noise to what otherwise would be rural signals. We also see language differences between urban and rural areas. So rural users tend to use less of what would be called location indicative words, things like sports terms or place names that are pretty specific to a region. And finally, there are some geographic parameters in the model that might be worth a second look. For instance, when the algorithm is determining what words it should weight have the heaviest in a prediction, it weights words with a high spatial variability as less important. But spatial variability is not a static concept. For instance, 25 kilometers in a rural area can mean something very different than 25 kilometers in an urban area. Meanwhile, for the network-based algorithm, a prediction is based on what is known about the individual self-identified friends. And so lots of urban users do not add noise to rural predictions because homophily is keeping these networks largely separate. There are still are language differences that matter. In this case, networks depend on the usage of mentions and tweets to build the network, and prevalence of this feature can vary across populations. And there are geographic parameters as well that come into play for determining the ground truth location of users in the network, but these factors just don't be, seem to be so prohibitive in the network-based algorithm as compared to the tech space algorithm. And finally, how do you achieve parity in these algorithms? Why don't people just use network-based methods? Why, well, they're not a panacea. So one piece in this paper that I haven't discussed is the coverage of these algorithms. Uh, so network-based algorithms require far more data and still can't make predictions about the location for many people who aren't particularly active on these platforms. However, combining these two methods, text-based and network-based, has shown problems for improving overall performance. And because these methods also seem to respond differently to population bias, a hybrid method also provides greater hope for improving performance in rural areas as well. And with that, I'll say thank you to the many individuals and organizations that assisted with this work, and I'll be happy to take questions. Hi, I'm Motahari from UIUC. Great and like timely work in okay. this area. I really like the way that you try to remove the population bias to understand if still there is an algorithmic bias at work. But I didn't understand why you make the rural, uh, rural data set 100% and the urban zero. So why you didn't make the 50-50? Uh, so that's kind of... Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, for this presentation, uh, we focused on the, the most extreme example just to show essentially the extent, you know, if you went all the way to 100%, what you would see. Uh, we actually did test the intermediate models, and what you find is essentially uh, you see it, you know, chart the progress uh, between the extremes. So it's not, if you have the balance um, mm -hmm. of data, essentially, there is no sweet spot where all of a sudden rural gets boosted. Um, you just see it slowly increase as you add more and more rural data. So always, like, rural accuracy is lower than urban one in the text space. Yeah, yeah, so as you increase the proportion, okay. it also increases. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Joe Constan, University of Minnesota. Thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end, you said something that I was going to ask you about, and I still will, okay. which <laughs> is you've made all these statements about more accurate while a hundred kilometers is not necessarily equally accurate in different places. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time you hit 200 kilometers, you've, you're between New York and New Haven or Philadelphia, which would be considered a pretty big miss. Yeah. In rural Montana, that same distance might not have nearly as big a difference in population. And I was wondering whether you think this problem would go away mm -hmm. if you measured in terms of the number of people between the point that you predict and the point that it actually was. So that if I'm off by 3.5 million people, mm -hmm. that's a comparable number, urban or rural. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say a few things to that. Um, 